child is born after her parents have had five miscarriages before she came along. She was called the Miracle Baby. As the Miracle Child grew up, she became a kind, sweet, pretty, and a smart person. The Miracle Baby had dreams and aspirations just like any other teenager. But all those dreams were soon going to turn into a horrific nightmare. She was about to become a victim to a dreadful killing, where she was killed multiple times in the heart. Exactly 39 years after her death, police took a man into custody after matching his DNA to blood found at the crime scene. It was an arrest that reopened the 40-year-old cold case, which was now finally solved. 18-year-old high school student Michelle Martenko belonged from her hometown of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Founded in 1858 and coeducational from its start, Iowa State became the nation's first designated land-grant institution. When the Iowa legislature accepted the provisions of the 1862 Morrill Act on September 11, 1862, making Iowa the first state in the nation to do so, Iowa State is known worldwide for its student-centered culture, and Michelle was a student who was an integral part of this culture. Michelle loved to dress up and style her blonde hair like Fairy Fawcett. Her family remembered her as being kind, sweet, funny, pretty, and smart. She sang in the school choir and wanted to study interior design at university. Her mom Janet had five miscarriages before Michelle was born. Michelle was born when Janet was 44 and she was known as the Miracle Baby. Diagnosed with scoliosis when she was just 12, Michelle had to wear a brace for two years to straighten her spine. Once the brace came off, she started getting a lot of attention from boys. One of those boys was Andy Seidel. Michelle and Andy dated for two years before they broke up. It was Michelle who wanted to end the relationship. She later dated another boy called Mike Myrick. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. All right, let's dive back into the video. But Andy wasn't prepared for her to move on. After they broke up, Andy wanted to know her every move. Who was she dating? Why was she dating that particular person? And everything else that concerned absolutely anything about her. On December 19th, 1979, Michelle had gone to a choir for an Avere celebration and then onto the mall in her hometown of Cedar Rapids, Iowa to buy a coat. At the mall, she bumped into a few of her friends from school, as well as Andy. Andy had allegedly gone to the mall to buy Michelle a Christmas present. To Andy, Michelle seemed very happy. Curtis Thomas, another boy who knew Michelle, saw her leave the mall just before closing time. I remember her smile, he said, the goodbye smile. After leaving the mall, she walked to the family car, which she had left in a dark corner of the parking lot. She turned on the engine to warm it up and sat there for a minute. Then someone opened the door, pushed her over, 29 times. One of the stabbings to her chest penetrated her aorta, and she bled to death in the car. When Michelle didn't arrive home that night, her family started to worry. Michelle's friend, Jane Hansen, remembered getting a call from Michelle's mother, Janet, who sounded frantic. Five days before Christmas, at around 4 a.m. on the morning of December 20th, police found Michelle's body in the family car, which was still in the parking lot. She was lying on the passenger side floor. She had defensive wounds from fighting her attacker. She hadn't been sexually assaulted and the cash she was carrying had not been taken. The attacker had been careful to hide his identity. He had worn rubber gloves so he didn't leave fingerprints. A police spokesman said that everyone's instinct was to say that it was a guy, but they were not sure of the gender of the killer. Based on the number and location of stabbed wounds, Police considered the killing to be personal in nature. At Michelle's funeral, Andy's behavior drew suspicion. Michelle's friend Gail Dawson remembered Andy being almost in the casket. Andy had his arms around her, and he was just sobbing. He said to Gail that he had to know who she loved when she died. Did she love him, or did she love Mike? Andy was questioned by police, but his mother provided an alibi for him. She said he was home from the mall by the time Michelle was murdered. Many people, including Michelle's family and friends, 
expected Andy to be charged, but he never was charged. He left Cedar Rapids to join the Navy. In the week after Martinko's murder, more than 200 people responded to the detective's appeals in the news for information concerning the case. Police interviewed numerous people, and several of them were cleared of suspicion through the use of a polygraph. Rumors began to circulate about the crime. Some thought that Martenko had received harassing phone calls before her death, but police stated that they did not think so. On June 19, 1980, police released a composite sketch developed based on descriptions provided by two witnesses. The description was of the man they believed stabbed Martenko. The sketch indicated a white man in his late teens or early 20s, weighing between 165 and 175 pounds and standing about six feet tall. Despite a sketch in hand, a description of the probable killer and 200 responses, the authorities were still not able to charge anyone with the murder. All the suspects coming in were soon cleared off. There was no solid evidence for an arrest to be made. Died in the 1990s, believing that Andy had killed their daughter. In 2006, 27 years after Martinko's killing, a new cold case investigator working for the Cedar Rapids Police Department became the investigator of this case. He discovered what he believed to be the killer's blood while he was reviewing the case files. From that, police were able to build a partial DNA profile. The results of the test for partial DNA were entered into the combined DNA index system, the National DNA Database, but no matches were found. Eventually, more than 125 people would have their DNA swabbed and compared against samples taken from the scene. Out of more than 80 potential suspects that had been identified over the years, more than 60 people were tested and eventually cleared of suspicion. A company specializing in DNA phenotyping was hired to create additional images of the killer based solely on DNA clues about facial appearance and ancestry. The images looked considerably different from the 1980 composite sketch and showed a man with blonde hair and blue eyes. The company also produced approximations of how the man would have aged in the years since the crime. In a press conference during which the new image was shared, a former classmate of Martenko exclaimed that the face looked like another one of their classmates, but that classmate had been investigated and was cleared based on a DNA swab several years before. In 2018, the DNA phenotype and company took the data they had collected the year before and entered it into GED Match, a public genealogy website that has been used by law enforcement to solve other cold cases, most famously that of the Golden State Killer. GED Match returned one person who shared DNA markers with the suspect in Martenko's murder, and it determined them to be likely the killer's second cousin once removed. The company created a family tree starting with four sets of the woman's gria and reported that the killer was most likely descended from one of those couples. An investigator with the Cedar Rapids Police Department contacted DNA-tested members of two of the branches of the family tree and eliminated those branches as containing the killer. He then contacted a member of a third branch and a DNA test determined that they were first cousins with the killer. That narrowed the suspects down to a set of three brothers who had grown up in Manchester, Iowa. The brothers were placed under surveillance and investigators began to attempt to collect their DNA secretly. On October 29, 2018, an investigator observed one of the brothers, Jerry Lynn Burns, drink multiple sodas using a plastic straw. When Burns disposed of the straw, the investigator collected it and tested it for DNA. Tests eliminated the other two brothers as suspects, but the DNA from Burns' straw matched the blood found on Martinko's clothing. On December 19, 2018, investigators went to Burns' business in Manchester, Iowa to interview him. He refused to voluntarily provide a sample of DNA, but was compelled to do so with a search warrant. His hands and arms were also examined for scars possibly left by the assumed cut sustained during the attack. Burns maintained that he did not know Mertanko and was not there when she died. It's a homicide that happened at Westdale Mall. M.M. -hmm. Michelle Martenko, is that something you've ever heard of? Yeah. Although an investigator later testified that Burns did not specifically deny killing Martenko, he was not able to provide an explanation for why his DNA would have been present at the crime scene. Burns showed almost no emotion during the interview, even when he was eventually told that he was being arrested. 
When asked if he had killed someone that night in 1979, Burns repeatedly told investigators to test his DNA. When the DNA sample was tested, it matched a blood sample found at the crime scene. On December 19, 2018, exactly 39 years after Martinko's murder, Burns was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He entered a plea of not guilty. His trial was originally scheduled for October 14, 2019, but in September, the defense requested a delay in order to gather more evidence and interview witnesses. The defense also requested the trial to be moved out to Lynn County. The prosecution did not resist either request, and the trial was rescheduled for February 10, 2020 in Scott County. The murder trial began on February 12, 2020. The prosecution emphasized the unlikelihood of the DNA evidence matching someone other than the person who left it at the scene. The doctor who performed Martinko's autopsy and investigators in the original case took the stand to testify to how investigation was conducted and to Martinko's cause of death. The defense argued that DNA evidence had been mishandled and that different articles of clothing from the scene should not have been stored together in one evidence bag. Prosecutors also played a video of a police interview of Burns, in which he denied being at the crime scene on the night of Martinko's murder and could not explain how his DNA had been found at the scene. They also played a later recording after Burns' arrest, in which Burns questioned whether he could have blocked out the memory of committing the crime. The defense brought only one witness, a self-described forensic DNA consultant, who testified on the possibility that police could have mishandled the evidence. He stated that Burns' DNA could have been at the scene due to secondary transfer, such as skin cells transferring to an article of clothing when someone brushes up against another person, although he clarified that it was not his opinion that this was the case with Burns' DNA. Prosecutors called a criminalist to contradict the defense's witness. The criminalist said that the storage of Martinko's clothing was not unusual. On February 24, 2020, after three hours of deliberation, the jury found Gerilyn Burns guilty of first-degree murder of Michelle Martinko. Iowan law mandated a life sentence without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder. On May 29, 2020, Burns' attorney filed a motion asking for a new trial, claiming his constitutional and state rights were violated and that the court made a mistake in overruling the request for evidence to be suppressed. Finally, on August 7, 2020, Burns was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In September 2020, Burns filed a notice of appeal. Burns is currently still imprisoned in the Animos Estate Penitentiary. In a way, Michelle was there in that trial. She was there because she fought so hard, and she struggled, and she fought so hard that she caused the killer to cut himself. And with that cut, he left his blood. And with that blood, he left his DNA which solved the mystery. What do you guys think? Was it Michelle who finally helped the detectives to solve the case of her own murder? What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. The blue-colored family of Kentucky history can tell us a lot about human beings. Sometimes, the stories of the past sound so unreal that it's very hard to believe them. For example, did you know that ancient Romans used to burn pepper and blow the fumes into a blind person's eyes to cure their blindness? It doesn't exactly fit our image of the great Romans now, does it? After finding out about this story, I was shocked but also curious at the same time. After digging into curious events from the past, I came across Martin and his blue-colored family. Wait, a real blue-colored family that's not from James Cameron's movie? Did you hear that right? 200 years ago, in the year 1820, a French orphan named Martin Fugate settled in the troublesome creek of eastern Kentucky. He had a simple reason to settle in Kentucky, to get married and start a family. Pretty much like any other human being on this planet, right? But there's a slight twist in the story. Fugate wasn't like the other people in this area, or even on this planet for that matter. He had a rare genetic condition due to which his skin color was a striking indigo blue. Despite his condition, Fugate found a match with a woman whose name was Elizabeth Smith. Even Elizabeth was described as being as pale as the mountain laurel that blooms every spring around the creek hollows. Nonetheless, Fugate and Elizabeth got married. In the 19th century, they wouldn't have any idea but what genes were, 
but little did they know that they both carried a recessive gene which caused a blood disorder called methemoglobinemia, because of which their skin color was extremely pale or even blue. After marriage, Fugate and Elizabeth had seven kids out of which the skin color of four of them was blue. The localities around them started calling them Blue Fugates. The locality in which the Blue Fugates were staying was a very rural and isolated region where even basic infrastructure, like proper roads, were lacking like much of the world in the 1980s. Now, in modern times, it's safe to guess that these localities were extremely backward, both in terms of infrastructure and thinking. And with all this backwardness, imagine someone spotting a Blue family. Although there weren't many people staying in their locality, it still made life tough for them. And even among those families, some were Lisbeth's own relatives. And for the other families to see a blue family every day, it was very weird and abnormal. And for this reason, they started ignoring and isolating the Fugate family. They were scared that if any of their family members happened to marry any member of the Fugate family, then the gene would get transferred to them and their future children would be the color blue. This belief was scientifically correct in hindsight and nobody interacted with the Fugates. But the Fugates couldn't spend their life in isolation. So they decided that they'll start inbreeding. Inbreeding at the time wasn't very surprising or taboo, because people at the time would often happen to marry their cousins. This was perfectly acceptable because it wasn't easy for the family to find suitors, but it also made sure that the family property would stay within the family. But there's a definite downside of inbreeding. Inbred humans often carry mental and physical disorders. And the same happened with the Fugates. Because of inbreeding, the Met Age gene was preserved in their family and their lineage went on for a long, long time. As time passed, the descendants of the Fugate family started settling in other places as well, and they were even accepted in different states, after which people started viewing them as normal individuals. And because of this, it became possible for them to marry outside their family with members who did not share their genes. Now, I've said Met Age gene so many times that you might be confused. What is this condition? Met hemoglobinemia is a rare condition which happens because of the overproduction of Met hemoglobinemia in the body. Because of its overproduction, the body tissues don't receive the required amount of oxygen, because of which the skin color eventually becomes blue. Usually, this condition is hereditary or happens because of the consumption of a specific food item or medicine. In many cases, both parents might not even be suffering from this condition and would have perfectly normal skin. What they still might carry the gene. But in the case of the Fugates, they not only had the recessive gene present in them, but one of them was also actively suffering from the condition. As a result, the chances of their children inheriting the condition became much, much higher. Initially, after looking at the Fugates, people used to think that they're the victim of some sort of illness. However, they were living a very normal and healthy lifestyle, except for the fact that their skin was blue. They showed no other symptoms of any kind of illness. But the story changed in our current times when Patrick and Rachel Ritchie, individuals with the same condition, thought it would be right to take the help of Dr. Madison Cowan. Hematologist Dr. Madison Cowan and his nurse Ruth Pendergrass were known for their immense contribution in the field of metaglobinemia. Their research was very significant in understanding the root cause of this condition and taking preventative action. After studying Patrick and Rachel, they compiled their whole family tree. In 1964, they said their detailed study that the blue color and pigmentation of the skin of the fugates can disappear if methylene blue is injected into them. This blue dye could allegedly cancel out the blue blood and convert it to red. But convincing the fugates to inject the blue dye wasn't an easy task. The Fugates had become very comfortable with the color of their skin. But because Patrick and Rachel had volunteered for their research, they decided to get this blue dye injected into them. What happened after taking this injection left everyone stunned. In just a few minutes after the injection, Patrick's skin color went from blue to pink. However, after that, it was known that the effect of the injection wears off as soon as the sufferer urinates. This is because the blue dye wasn't capable of fixing the enzyme deficiency that they had. So the solution that looked permanent was found to be very momentary. Dr. Cowan found one more fix through this experiment. He made a bunch of methylene blue pills for the family to consume every day. Meanwhile, Dr. Cowan and his nurse Ruth got to know through their study and research that before Martin Fugate and Elizabeth Smith, there were two more people who had this gene present in them. Because of this, 
modern-day experts and researchers still have debates and disagreements methamyglobinemia patients are necessarily the descendants of the Fugitz family. Dr. Ailu Tafari, who himself is a hematologist, says that he almost never see a patient with it today. It's a disease that one learns about in medical school, and it's infrequent enough to be on every exam in hematology. It also exemplifies the intersection between disease and society and the danger of misinformation and stigmatization. In the 1970s in Kentucky, the last Fugate was born. Benjamin Stacy was the last UGA to have blue skin and he lived a healthy life. Benjamin was born with a dark, purplish skin right off the bat. Doctors were keen to know about the baby's health. After running the tests, it was known that the baby was healthy and carried the rare genetic disorder just like his family. However, as Benjamin grew up, the blue color from his skin started disappearing to a large extent, so much so that on his body, the color remained only on his lips and fingertips. And even that was only visible when he was angry or felt cold. This could have happened because Fugits moved out of Kentucky and married people from different regions. That's why maybe the effects of this condition were minimal in Benjamin. Fortunately or unfortunately, there's no trace of any more blue babies of the Fugit's descendants. However, it's quite possible that this condition must have existed in some other family in some other corner of the world. Now where are they and are they really there? This was a story of such a family about who I'm not sure many people know of. And I'm sure that there are even more stories that neither you nor I will ever find out about. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. When eight-year-old Maddie Clifton disappeared, an entire town sprung into action while the whole nation watched. Maddie had mysteriously vanished from her home in Jacksonville, Florida on November 3, 1998. Hundreds of volunteers joined search parties, camera crews flocked to the suburbs, and her two parents tried not to despair. Then, after a week of relentless efforts, Maddie Clifton was found bludgeoned and F asterisk 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 ed to death under the bed of her 14-year-old neighbor. When police found her body, the neighbor first explained that he had struck Clifton in the face while playing basketball with her, then accidentally killed her when he hit her with the bat to stop her from crying. But the neighbor's account was only half of the Maddie Clifton story, and the truth was far more darker. The crime took place in such an unusual way that it shattered everyone, from the authorities to the citizens in the neighborhood. Nobody could believe that such a thing could actually exist and happen around them. Born on June 17, 1990 in Jacksonville, Florida, Maddie Clifton was raised at a time when parents allowed their children to roam free. The Columbine High School shooting had time to curb that lenience, and the fear of terrorism had yet to blanket a nation. Told to play outside on November 3, 1998, having no idea about what was going to happen to her, Maddie Clifton did just that. It was Tuesday when Maddie Clifton went out to play in the suburbs. Her father Steve, mother Sheila, and 11-year-old sister Jessie lived with her in the Jacksonville home. It was election day. Maddie had been at school that day and after school. She went straight home and arrived back at the house around 4.30 p.m. At home, Maddie practiced her piano until her mother Sheila returned home from voting. As soon as Sheila was home, Maddie ran outside to play. She knew she had a short period of time to play before she needed to be home again for dinner. A lot of children played out on the street. Maddie went to her 16-year-old neighbor's yard to hit some golf balls. She returned to her own yard to get more golf balls. Sheila called Maddie and Jesse in for dinner at 6.20 p.m. There was no sign of Maddie in the yard, so Sheila asked her neighbors if they saw her. They helped to look for her, but she didn't appear to be anywhere on the street. Sheila called 911 to report her daughter missing at 6.30 p.m. The search for Maddie intensified and hundreds of volunteers looked for her, but she was not found. In the days that followed, thousands of flyers were handed out. Maddie's parents appealed for information. The media covered the disappearance extensively and police questioned neighbors. Some were questioned multiple times. The first seven days of her disappearance were described as a circus. Non-stop search parties, police, news reporters and missing prison flyers everywhere. Everyone was set on finding Maddie alive. The National Guard was even called to walk through the sewer systems for potential leads. 
the world had seemingly come to halt for her family. What went from a night of playing outside turned into every mother's worst nightmare. And nobody had an idea that it was going to turn into something worse than a nightmare. On November 10th, Maddie's parents had just finished taping an interview with a national news program, hoping it would result in information on Maddie's disappearance. When their neighbor Missy Phillips ran across the street to find a police officer, Phillips had led the officer to the bedroom of her 14-year-old son. Missy had been cleaning her son's room when she noticed his waterbed to be leaking onto the floor. She began checking the bed when she found the source of the leak. The leak turned out to be Maddie Clifton's body, which was entombed inside the frame. Maddie's body was found partially clothed, bludgeoned with a baseball bat, multiple times. Missy Phillips had even been a part of the search parties, unaware that Maddie's body was so close inside her own house. Police drove to Missy Phillips' son, Joshua Earl Phillips, cool to arrest him for the murder of Maddie Clifton. I found Maddie Clifton this morning at about 7.30 a.m., Joshua Phillips was born on March 17, 1984 in Allentown, Pennsylvania, but in the early 1990s. His family moved across the street from the Cliftons in Florida. His father, Steve Phillips, a computer specialist, was incredibly strict and violent towards his wife, Melissa, and towards Josh as well. On January 13, 1999, Maddie's autopsy was made public, revealing she died of blunt impacts to the head with skull fractures. Stab wounds to the neck may have contributed to her death, but there was no evidence of S asterisk 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 ING injury. On November 16, 1998, prosecutors announced that they will try Joshua as an adult and will ask a Duval County grand jury for a first degree murder indictment. And on November 19, the grand jury indicted Phillips for first degree murder. He was moved from the juvenile detention center to the Duval County jail where he was held without bail to await a trial. As Joshua was arrested, he didn't take much time to confess to the murder, but in his own defensive ways. He confessed that he blended in with the rest of Maddie's searchers, although he could barely contain his harrowing secret. Only he knew where Maddie Clifton was, in his room and under his bed. According to Joshua, Maddie's murder was a bad decision that stemmed from an accident. Joshua then recalled the series of events that happened that day when Maddie disappeared. He said that Maddie had come over to ask him to play baseball with her outside. He was home alone at the time, and he agreed to Maddie's proposition. While they were playing outside, he accidentally hit a baseball in her eye. When she started to bleed, cry and scream, he panicked. Joshua said that he was worried that his father would be angry and that fear caused him to drag Maddie Clifton into his house. As he physically dragged her inside, her lower clothing came off her body. Once upstairs, he beat her with a baseball bat to get her to stop crying and then shoved her under his bed. After that, his father did arrive home. Joshua spent the night with his family. And when he went back upstairs, he realized Maddie was still alive. At this point, he cut her with a small knife, then left her there once more. He later claimed that he was trying to ignore what he had done. That was my defense for everything as a kid. If something was wrong, ignore it. It will go away, said Josh in his statement. But this did not simply go away though. On July 6, 1999, the trial for Maddie Clifton's murder started. Attorney Richard D. Nichols defended Joshua Phillips. Nichols' strategy was considered abnormal, as he did not call a single witness to the stand, nor did he allow Josh to testify. His whole argument hinged on his closing argument that the murder was an act that began as an accident and deteriorated through the panic that bordered on madness. State Attorney Harry Shorstein made an argument that the murder may have been F asterisk 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 ing motivated even though there was no evidence of sexual assault. He pointed out some conflicting evidence and arguments like there was no dirt on Maddie's lower body that would be consistent with Josh's story of her clothes coming off outside from being dragged. There was no blood on the baseball but that Josh claimed hit Maddie, and this caused that there was no blood in the backyard where they were supposedly playing, and Maddie's older sister claimed that Josh would talk about sex with both her and Maddie. During the trial, the state walked the jury through the day of the murder, including computer history and records. What police found was that 30 minutes before Maddie Clifton's murder, Joshua had been using the family computer to browse hardcore and violent p asterisk 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 
Although the medical examiner found no evidence of assault, Maddie Clifton's pants and underwear were also from her body. There was one piece of inadmissible evidence from the defense that many believe could have also swayed the jury. Josh had brain scans taken from a neurologist that showed he had lesions on his frontal lobe. These lesions were in a spot that could, in theory, impair his judgment and induced panic and high stress. However, the judge did not allow that evidence to be weighed in the jury's decision. The trial only lasted two days, and the jury came to a decision within two hours of deliberating. They found him guilty of first-degree murder. Joshua Phillips was sentenced to life in prison without parole, as he was too young to receive the death penalty. He is imprisoned at Taylor NX in Perry, Florida. Since his trial, there have been multiple appeals for his case. In 2012, the Supreme Court declared sentencing juveniles to life in prison without parole as unconstitutional, which is one of the biggest factors in his upcoming resentencing trial in 2013. When Joshua began serving his sentence, the pain he inflicted on an innocent family continued. There was no closure for them despite the life sentence. Maddie's parents dealt with their grief in different ways and they divorced after 25 years of marriage. They had been together for 30 years. Missy's husband, Steve Phillips, died in a car crash. In 2020, having exhausted other appeals, Joshua appealed to the Supreme Court, but the Florida Supreme Court turned down Joshua's appeal. Justices declined to hear arguments and the appeal. I did something horrible. I am so sorry, so sorry for what happened. I wished God that I could have known this or understood this when I was 14. Had I then, none of this would have come about. I had no clue what life meant, what death meant, nor the death of suffering that could follow one act. A psychiatrist assigned to the case claims that more weight should have been added to Joshua Phillips' background and family history. Had it been, the jury would have heard that he was F asterisk 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 ing abused as a child, had an abusive father and had the mother dealing with extreme depression. The state of Florida claims that Joshua Phillips deserves to stay in prison, at least for another 25 years. What do you guys think about these contradictory arguments? And whom do you agree with? There's no doubt that Joshua Phillips killed Maddie Clifton. But why did he kill her? And should his young age, brain lesions, and prison behavior be taken into account for his 2023 resentencing? What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. Alright, let's dive back into the video. One night, a husband would come home to his wife sleeping. He would go ahead and kiss her, but to his scary fortunes, the husband would find out that he actually kissed his dead wife. Today, we bring you to the forefront of a cold case from Iowa that gained national attraction due to the nature of its events that unfolded. It is hard to imagine that even a family can be torn apart to an extent that they end up pointing fingers and accusing each other of murder. As the person who was convicted for the killing was revealed to be the son of the victim, this case turned out to be highly sensational and controversial in its own ways. This case was riddled with accusations, backstories, and a lot of money. Shirley Carter was born on June 10th, 1947 in Des Moines, Iowa. She was the daughter of a shoemaker. She married Bill Carter in 1963. The couple farmed together in the Pleasantville area. The two also had three children, after which Shirley took on the role of a mother, along with helping Bill in his work. Eventually, as their children grew up and got married, she also became a grandmother. On the day of June 19, 2015, everything drastically changed for the Carter family. Bill Carter had dropped off Shirley at their home after getting coffee in the morning. Bill then went to work to haul corn. This was a job that both he and his son Jason did on a contractual basis. After some time, Bill went to work on another load, and his son Jason went back home. It was then that Jason found his mother's lifeless body. Upon finding the body, Jason called to inform his sister before he called 911. And then it was the time when Bill received a call from his daughter stating that his wife was dead. 
In the 911 call, Jason also mentioned a bullet hole in the refrigerator. He reported that her arms were folded on her chest. Later he said that it looked like she was sleeping, so he kissed her. But when he came to his senses, he realized that he was kissing the lifeless body of his wife. Soon the police officers arrived at the scene with the DCI unit. Shirley Carter was found shot to death inside her residence in Lacona, Iowa. She was 68 years old at the time of her death. Were two gunshot wounds on her body. The first shot hit her at the bottom of her heart, while the second gunshot ruptured her heart. During the scanning of the crime scene, the authorities figured that no money was either stolen or even moved from where it was in the house. This made them believe strongly in the possibility of the involvement of a familiar person in the murder. Police officers were now more akin to assume that it could have been someone with a personal vendetta. There were several investigators who teamed up to solve this case. They chased several leads to bring the case to justice. They were sure of the involvement of a closely related person to the Carter family. But the question was who that person was. Was it Bill, Shirley's beloved husband? Was it Shirley's daughter? Or was it Jason, Shirley's own son? Soon the authorities were going to come across a probable motive that involved one of them. The investigation is where most things broke loose in this case. The Carter family, which seemingly had no problems when looked at from the outside, soon erupted with accusations against each other. Bill Carter claimed to be in immense frustration and grief. During this time, he attempted suicide two times, but could not get himself across the line to death. He then decided to take matters into his own hands by hiring an attorney and a private investigator. This investigation led him to file a wrongful death suit against his son, Jason Carter. Though Jason Carter was regarded as a suspect by the police officers, there were still no arrests made. Found out that Jason had several reasons for getting Shirley Carter killed. Jason had some ongoing financial troubles for which he was desperate to find solutions and he had an alleged mistress who Shirley Carter got to know about recently. Jason Carter was also the next in line to inherit the farm. All of this made Bill Carter resolute in his belief that Jason had killed his mother. Bill also accused the law enforcement of not doing the investigation thoroughly. As Bill pushed with his claim against Jason, the trial of Jason for the wrongful death civil lawsuit began in 2017. The Marion County jury favored Bill Carter's claim and stated that Jason Carter would have to pay $10 million. Just two days after the civil verdict, Jason was charged and arrested for first-degree murder. And there began a series of accusations pointing fingers, seeking justice in higher courts, and tricky criminal trials. In 2019, the case had a criminal trial in which Jason Carter was proved not guilty of his mother's murder. Since then, Jason Carter has focused on multiple attempts to overturn the civil verdict. Jason had argued that his father was responsible for shooting Shirley in the kitchen of their rural Lacona home. But even after this accusation, the jurors had their inclination towards Bill Carter's claim and they sided with him. On the other hand, Jason Carter's attorney, Allison Kane, claimed that the jury would never have reached the conclusion against Jason if they had heard about the new evidence that he claimed to know. Kane claimed that his team had a series of interviews that essentially contained the story, which implicates the Fallowell brothers as having shot Shirley Carter. Kane filed a 46-page petition asking a judge to throw out the civil judgment. The petition gave new details about Joel and John Follow Will, brothers who had a history of criminal drug charges in Marion County. A Marion County jail inmate allegedly told the authorities that the brothers confessed to him that they had killed Shirley Carter. He claimed that the Falwell brothers, along with Matt Kamarik, were burglarizing the home when Shirley Carter spooked them, so they shot her twice. Defense attorneys said that they just learned about the possible suspects because the Division of Criminal Investigation is required to turn over all its investigative files before the criminal trial. If the criminal trial had gone first, we would have had access to all this evidence that we would have been able to use in the civil trial, Kane said in Jason's defense. Bill Carter on the other side, said that the new evidence doesn't change anything, and that his son Jason is responsible for Shirley Carter's death. In the now-dismissed action, Jason Carter had sued his father Bill Carter, his brother Billy Carter, and the estate, asking the court to vacate the civil judgment entered in 2017. As he has done prior, 
Jason Carter claimed that he obtained new evidence about law enforcement's investigation during the criminal discovery process as he mounted a defense to first-degree murder charges. However, the courts did not find that argument persuasive. Courts ruled that Jason Carter's team had knowledge of the evidence prior and that the newly discovered evidence was hearsay and not admissible anyway. It also added that the evidence doesn't align with the theory Jason Carter had presented at a civil trial. As a result, the district court and the Iowa Supreme Court concluded that the evidence would not have changed the civil verdict. Thus, they denied Jason Carter's attempts to vacate it to obtain a new trial. Later, in a state lawsuit, Jason Carter alleged a violation of constitutional rights, torturous infliction of severe emotional distress, negligent and wrongful termination, and abuse of process. Eventually, the state lawsuit was dismissed as well. The dismissal, which was on jurisdictional grounds, is pending appeal. A federal lawsuit filed along the same lines was originally dismissed, but then partially revived by appeal and now it is pending another appeal. Unfortunately for Bill Carter, there's still no closure. He strongly believes that Jason killed his mother with strong motives in his bag, but Jason also seems adamant about proving his innocence and going all the way for it. But the question here remains, if Jason didn't kill his mother, who did? And does it mean that the killer is still out there? What do you guys think? Did Jason Carter plot the murder of his own mother and then stage a 911 call? Or was it Bill Carter who believed strongly that it was his son who killed his wife? Or was it someone else who wasn't even suspected during the investigation? What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. It's late afternoon in the Kalbar town of Queensland's picturesque scenic rim region, and a cool fall breeze softly sweeps through hundreds of fresh sunflowers. Vanessa Fowler, a mother of two visits to remember her beloved little sister. Vanessa says it was her favorite flower. She was a great lady in every aspect. She was strong, resilient, and passionate. The tragic murder of Alison Baden-Clay, her baby sister. What happened to her? Let us go into the investigation. Brisbane is the third most populous city in Australia and is located in Queensland. It's known for the river that runs through it. Despite its location beside a river, the town constructed an urban beach that is the size of five Olympic swimming pools. To preserve the street's beach, it was the place where the story of a woman's murder happened. It was among the most high-profile homicide cases Queensland has ever seen. The tale of the Baden-Clay family from Brisbane was first shown on Australian television in 2012. On April 20, 2012, Friday, Gerard Baden-Clay called authorities at about 7.12 a.m. report his 43-year-old wife, Allison, missing. He said that Allison had gone for a walk in their wealthy Brookfield neighborhood early in the morning. According to Gerard, she did this frequently. She did not, however, come for breakfast that day. He told Allison's parents the same thing. The police started looking for the missing person right away. First, they questioned their neighbors if they had seen anything or remembered seeing either between 8.30 p.m. Thursday and 8 a.m. on Friday. A Holden Captiva and Toyota Prado were the vehicles. A search involving hundreds of volunteers along with the police began immediately. An extensive investigation, including aircraft and police on horseback, was conducted across the rough terrain. In addition, they looked in the D. Aguilar National Park's neighboring mountain forest. Firefighters also searched closed mine shafts. All of these attempts were organized by Sergeant Sharky Lang. According to Gerard, on April 23rd, police set up a mannequin in the Baden-Clay front yard wearing the exact clothing Allison was last seen wearing. Allison was eventually discovered by a kayaker, not by the cops. On April 30th, the kayaker was near Anstead on Colo Creek. Allison was found at 11 a.m. on the muddy stream banks and resting on her side. Her arms were stretched out and her decomposition was advanced. Her blue shirt was pulled over her head, giving the impression that she had been dragged. Dental records were used to verify Allison's identification. According to the autopsy, Allison would have left significant gouge wounds on the intruder's face since some remains were under her nails. Her family and friends were beyond devastated upon hearing the news. Allison was a pure soul. 
She was a quiet and composed woman. On July 1, 1968, Allison June Dickey was born. She was the second daughter of Priscilla and Jeff Dickey's three children. Allison was raised in Red Bank, a working-class area. She began her lifelong love of ballet at the age of four, and her biggest dream was to start her own ballet studio. Allison won the Miss Brisbane Beauty Pageant at 25 in 1994 and was around 5 feet 6 inches tall. She was also an impressive polyglot with Japanese, Dutch, English, French, German, and Swedish being among her languages. Her friends had always considered her to be lucky and could not have imagined such disastrous things to happen to this Wonder Woman. She was an ambitious woman who was on her way to accomplishing her dreams, but unfortunately fate stopped her. The family was beyond shattered and couldn't figure out who could have done it since Allison has no enemies. They didn't know how to convey the news to the three little souls waiting for their mommy to come back. Allison was the head of human resources at Flight Center Airport when she met Gerard Baden-Clay. He was based at their Tombaugh office. On August 23, 1997, they married. Gerard Baden-Clay was born in Bournemouth, England. He moved to Australia when he was 10 years old with his parents and two younger siblings. He was the great-grandson of Robert Baden-Powell, the founder of the Boy Scouts of America. Gerard is around six feet tall, with a medium body and short brown hair. The couple moved back to England after their marriage but returned to Australia in 1999. Gerard and Allison were both employed with Century 21, real estate company in 2004 and had three lovely young daughters. Gerard Bate and Clay became the managing director of Century 21, real estate, after which he finally partnered with two others, with Gerard becoming in charge of their real estate company's finances. Tony McHugh was a client of Gerard's real estate firm in 2007. She was a married mother and ended up ending her 17-year-long marriage. A buddy of hers assisted her in obtaining employment with Remax Real Estate Company. This guy had been Gerard's business partner, and it was through him that he had met Tony. Tony worked hard and eventually became a special agent there. Authorities interviewed several people throughout the inquiry, including Tony, Gerard, and his business partners. They started putting the puzzle pieces together one by one. According to investigators, Allison's insurance was worth $800,000 to $950,000. Allison's estate was also handed to her parents. Her life insurance plans were included in this, which also ordered that her two insurance plans were ordered to be kept in trust. Investigators had also found that someone was working on collecting Allison's life insurance while her body was being autopsied. It was Gerard, and there they found some evident marks on his face, which were expected to be made by Allison. But these were just assumptions. There was not enough evidence to prove him as the murderer. Where the Crown or prosecution said he sought to cash in on his wife's life insurance policy to pay off his debts. According to a forensic accountant, Gerard owed roughly $300,000 to various relatives and friends while he barely had $70,000 in his bank account. Tony McHugh was brought into the scene. Tony McHugh had said that Gerard phoned her after his wife vanished and ordered her to be quiet. She also said that he did not have the financial means to divorce her. These shocking revelations meant that Gerard and Tony were having an affair with one another. Gerard had informed Tony that he intended to divorce his wife and marry her one day, and he often met Tony without his wedding band on. He confessed to Tony that he loved her and intended to divorce his wife for her, but he also stated multiple times that he couldn't leave Allison because she was depressed. Gerard had also set up a phony email account to contact Tony without Allison being aware during this time. Allison, according to Gerard, was monitoring his phone conversations and text messages and had even imposed a curfew on him. If Allison knew about the affair, she definitely would have been surprised because the pair was in the middle of marriage counseling and had no intention of splitting. Three days before her abduction, the couple had attended a marriage therapy session. Gerard Bade and Clay liked to resent himself as a devout middle-class spouse and parent. He was concerned about his social position and how others perceived him. The truth, however, was completely different. Of course, Gerard had rekindled his romance with Tony McHugh. Gerard didn't appear to be working on his marriage, and he frequently publicly humiliated Allison. Gerard and Tony would be openly romantic toward one another at several work events they went together. 
He was also in debt to several friends and business acquaintances. Gerard admitted to his business partners that they were having financial problems at that point, which had surprised them because they had been having a great year and were unsure about where all of their money had gone. The business needed financial assistance, and all three partners agreed that any money leaving the company had to be signed. Gerard was no longer allowed to be the only one in charge of the capital. With Gerard Bade and Clay directly facing his partners, this barely lasted a few weeks. He didn't want to have to ask for their autographs constantly, and he repeatedly expressed his dissatisfaction with their lack of faith in him. Besides these incidences, Allison's diaries were introduced as evidence when the trial began on June 10, 2014. According to the journals, jurors heard Allison's views on her marriage and hardships, and how she tried to make her marriage work despite Gerard's treachery. Allison found out about the affair three and a half years later. Tony was sacked from Gerard's Century 21 business in October 2011, putting an end to the romance. According to the prosecutor, Gerard murdered Allison for financial gain. On his behalf, Gerard testified. His side of the story was that he lied about everything he said in the past, but that everything he claimed at the trial was proper. Gerard acknowledged Tony's four-year affair during his trial. He also admitted having previous relationships. However, none of them mattered because they were irrelevant to him. The jury didn't believe Gerard, and on July 15th, he was found guilty and condemned to life in jail with the prospect of release after 15 years. Gerard's defense attorneys sought an appeal in August 2015 based on a new premise. They were now claiming that Gerard had killed Allison accidentally during an altercation. He became scared and attempted to conceal the murder. On December 8th of that year, Gerard was successful in his appeal. Instead of being found guilty of murder, he was found guilty of manslaughter. Even though Gerard lied about how he got scratches on his face and sought to cover up Allison's death, the Court of Appeals found a reasonable inference that he was innocent of premeditated murder. The court dismissed the Crown's motive of financial gain. His marital problems were insufficient to warrant a murder conviction, and the prosecution erred by failing to introduce evidence excluding the possibility of accidental death. In July 2016, the High Court, consisting of five justices, heard an appeal from Queensland prosecutors who argued against Bade and initial Clay's conviction being downgraded. The High Court probed the defense about the change in their case. However, according to her autopsy, Allison died from a hit to the head after collapsing. It was ruled accidental, since there was a prior argument between the two and that cannot be counted as murder, but rather an accident. In August, the High Court restored the original Gerard Bade and Clay conviction and the unanimous verdict. Domestic and Family Violence Prevention Month is observed in May. We go into it knowing that, in 2022, we've already lost 17 ladies in four months. Every time they've been slain, it's been by someone that they know. There are no winners in domestic violence. We've made some progress since Alison Byton Clay's case stunned the country. But not nearly enough. Thanks to their support and devotion, Alison's friends and family have formed a foundation in her honor. Through education and assistance, the Alison Byton Clay Foundation aims to raise attention to many types of domestic and familial abuse. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. It was mid-February when the cold weather turned Michigan into a snowy paradise. 30-year-old Roxanne Laywood and her husband Terry Wood were enjoying their day at a bowling alley in Niles without realizing that their day would become a nightmare for both of them. After a while, when the thick and dense clouds started to scatter in the sky, Roxanne left the bowling alley and headed home first as they drove separately. It took 45 minutes for Terry to come back home for dinner. Terry entered his home and found Roxanne brutally murdered in their kitchen. For around 35 years, Terry was the suspect of great suspicion. But the case took a twist in 2021. What happened to Roxanne Lay would at her home in Barron County, Michigan? How was the decades-old cold case solved by students at Western Michigan University? Niles is one of a kind. There will be many family-friendly events downtown throughout the year. The city makes an effort by hosting several festivals as well. People enjoyed living there and celebrating these events. But unfortunately, the chances of becoming a victim of crime in Niles are high.
Compared to Michigan, Niles has a crime rate that is higher than 95% of the state's cities and towns of all sizes. Based on FBI crime data, Niles is not one of the safest communities in America. It is the town where Rox and Wood turned into a victim, and her husband Terry was put under a cloud of suspicion. It was April 15, 1956, when Dale Woods of Niles and Patricia Chadwell of South Bend were blessed with a beautiful baby girl in Niles. They named her Roxanne Lee Wood. Roxanne Wood, lovably known as Rock, to those in her circle grew up in Niles with her siblings Janet, Jerry, Bruce, and Rick Woods. Roxanne was a member of Niles Junior Achievement. She graduated from Niles High School in 1974 and then worked in a customer service role for automated molded plastics company across the state line in South Bend, Indiana. Years passed and Roxanne got married eventually. She married Terry Wood and the couple's relationship seemed perfect. Roxanne enjoyed cooking, baking, and sharing their family recipes with friends. She also started growing rose bushes around their place because she was very fond of flowers, rose bushes. Everything went smoothly for the couple until 1987. On a snowy day in February, Roxanne and Terry spent a happy day at the bowling alley to celebrate her 31st birthday. After a while, when the thick and dense clouds began to scatter in the sky, Roxanne left the bowling alley. She headed home first since they both drove separately. Terry told her that he would be coming back in some time, so Roxanne thought of preparing dinner for both. It took 45 minutes for Terry to go back home for dinner. He never expected that the night would haunt him for the rest of his life. When Terry entered his home, he saw his beloved Roxanne lying in a pool of blood with her throat slashed. Terry felt wholly broken and devastated to see Roxanne in that condition, and he immediately reported the murder to the officials. He was mourning in confusion about the mysterious murder. Finally, the police and investigators reached the crime scene. Terry told the officers that Roxanne had left home early from the bowling alley and told them about the entire scenario of what happened that day. The police initially suspected Terry, but they found that a back utility door had been forcibly entered. They also noticed a blood drop spilled on the floor that didn't belong to Terry, so the officials believed that some mysterious murderer was roaming outside. The droplet of blood on the door and the results of a sexual assault kit were entered into the state's combined DNA index system, but unfortunately no matches were found, and they couldn't get enough evidence that could produce any leads. Since it was a time when forensic technology was in its infancy with a lack of proper evidence, nobody could stop the case from growing cold. Cold cases are still a nightmare for most law enforcers, yet people trust their officials to bring closure to the family. But in Roxanne's case, for 35 years, her killer remained elusive, and Terry was living under a massive cloud of suspicion. However, the officials were striving hard to bring answers to Roxanne's mysterious murder. So the Michigan State Police reopened the investigation in 2000, but were unsuccessful in finding her killer. The police never gave up. They reopened the case in 2020, but this time the Michigan State Police decided to take a new approach. Detective First Lieutenant Chuck Christensen and Western Michigan University students under the program director, Dr. Ashlyn Kirsten, teamed up in a new partnership to solve Roxanne's case, which was the first case for Western Michigan University students. It was also a part of the school's cold case program, where students provided a fresh set of eyes to review hundreds of files and evidence. Michigan State Police provided Western Michigan University student team with their case files. First, student investigators took those boxes of loose paper files and organized them chronologically into binders spanning over 3,000 pages. Next, the students scanned the massive case file and converted it into a searchable digital format. The digital file was game-changing for detectives. They made it searchable and portable, so sifting through the available information was far more practical. Estimated that the doctoral students Ashley Klebeck and Carl Huber put in 1,200 hours of work over eight months on Wood suit, organizing several boxes of files that had been amassed during the investigation. In addition, Students at Western Michigan University reportedly cataloged the 3,000-page case working alongside investigators to solve the mystery. Student investigators also read through Roxanne's file in total, familiarizing themselves with the details of the case. 
They also took their extensive notes and did a follow-up research via internet sources. Even meetings with detectives were done for student investigators to bring up any questions or inconsistencies and for the group to discuss the case. MSP also enlisted the help of Identifinders International, Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick's California-based genetic genealogy company. They found that the perpetrator had left DNA evidence at Roxanne's mysterious murder scene, but the sample was degraded. Then, in what would turn out to be a landmark case, Identifinders successfully tested the sample using the lowest amount of DNA to date and found a possible family connection. A genealogist named Gabriela Vargas finally gave Michigan State Police the name of a possible suspect. The police immediately collected a cigarette butt. The defendant had discarded. Gabriela confirmed that the person who left his DNA at Roxanne's murder scene was 67-year-old Patrick Wayne Gillum. For around 35 years, Terry was the suspect of great suspicion. But the case took a twist in 2021 when they matched the DNA samples with Patrick. After Patrick was identified as a suspect, undercover units surveilled him extensively, and he was interviewed on two separate occasions. Patrick was first interviewed by the Michigan State Police at the South Bend Police Department on July 29, 2021. He denied ever going to Michigan except for work in 1987, which was when he was on parole in Indiana. During the second time, Patrick denied knowing the street where Wood's family lived or knowing Roxanne, would when shown pictures of her. But when Detective Bailey informed Patrick that the woman in the picture had been assaulted, Patrick began to breathe rapidly, and his hands shook as he held them up. At that time, Patrick said he needed to talk to a lawyer and the interview ended. Patrick was arrested for Roxanne Wood's murder on the 17th of February, 2022, almost 35 years from the day of Roxanne's murder. Investigators did not divulge many details following the arrest of Patrick in February. Police then said that new technology helped link Patrick to the crime. After pleading no contest to second-degree murder, Patrick was sentenced on the 25th of April, 2022, to a minimum of 23 years in prison. He was also charged with breaking and entering an occupied dwelling. Forcefully breaking into an occupied space carries a maximum penalty of 15 years in prison. Meanwhile, the officials also found that Patrick had previously committed a similar crime in but did not murder her. The victim survived the attack and was the primary witness against him, and Patrick was incarcerated for that crime. However, he had been released early, just six months after he murdered Roxanne. The identification of Patrick not only brought Roxanne's killer to justice, but it cleared Terry Wood's name after 35 years of suspicion. In Roxanne's case, telling the world what happened to her took three decades. Thanks to the recent and ongoing advancements in DNA technology, and investigative tactics done by a genealogist named Gabriella Vargas and Western Michigan University students under Dr. Ashlyn Kirsten, who spent their valuable time to bring closure to the case and peace to the victim's family. Mysterious Hook offers our thoughts and prayers to Roxanne's family, and our tremendous respect and support for Western Michigan University students and the team, who helped crack a decades-old cold case. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below.